Hello everyone and welcome to our September Dime Journal Club. I this is always my favorite um, sort of event each month as part of our programming. I love these smaller group conversations about some of the uh, sort of bleeding edge research um, that's always recently published when we discuss it here with sort of experts from our community. I am particularly excited um, about the discussion today and really want to take a second um, and congratulate Elena, Ben and the rest of the team um, that published uh, this really excellent manuscript. Not only is it a wonderful and important piece of work for our field, but this is the culmination um, of efforts by one of our first member initiated working groups here at DIME. So I think it's a reflection of um, what under extraordinary leadership um, and within our research uh, community, uh, we can actually do at the grassroots level, really coming together as diverse experts, identifying a problem that needs to be solved um, and collaborating to tackle that um, and to make um, some really good uh, new scholarship available to the field writ large. Um, so with that, welcome everyone um, on the line. Um, Elena and Ben, I'm going to hold on just a second um, before I hand over to you guys. For folks who may not have participated in a journal club before, let me just orient you all so you know how this will work. Um, the first important thing to share, we always disclose that this session is being recorded um, and of course that means that both recording and the slides will be available on our website afterwards in case you want to share with your colleagues. The way that we structure the session is that Elena and Ben as sort of lead authors um, on this project will spend um, about 10 minutes or so really giving you the author's viewpoint on the most important parts um, of this manuscript, giving you sort of their cliff notes from the author's perspective. Um, and then we'll throw it open for conversation. We really try and structure this as an ask me anything session. So related to the manuscript, related to the topics that we discuss, um, we'll have a conversation um, and really sort of pick Elena and Ben's brains um, during the course of our time together today. Um, the way we'll handle that is um, there's a number of ways you can pose your questions. You can raise your hand. Um, if you're familiar with that functionality, we have the chat function and we also have the Q&A function. I'll monitor those um, and wherever possible, um, if you are in a spot where you can be unmuted, I'll unmute you and get you to pose your question as part of the discussion live. Um, so with that, um, let me hand over Elena and Ben. Thank you for being here today. I'm going to stop sharing. Elena, you're going to drive the slides. Um, and if you could start by introducing yourself um, to everyone we have on the line um, and then take it away. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for this discussion. I'm going to share my slides. Can you see my slides? Perfect. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone, again, and I'm really happy to be here. Thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Elena Ismailova. I am Chief Scientific Officer at Conexa Health, a company that uh, provides research services and technology platform for digital data collection in clinical trials. Ben, can you please introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, so my name is Ben Van Andries. Uh, I'm Chief Medical at uh, Biteflice. We're a, a European slash US company uh, building wearable devices for this, exactly the type of data collection that we're going to be talking about today. So recently we published a paper um, in clinical and translational science in the July issue, um, and I'm really proud of this work. I will tell you a short story how this project um, came together, but I would like to start this conversation by thanking the group of uh, authors, and it was great pleasure to work with this group people for putting an effort and time uh, to make this uh, manuscript uh, publication. Um, happen. And um, this is something to celebrate about this list of co-authors because they represent really cross-functional collaborative nature of the digital medicine field. We have here members from academic and industry. We have data analysts, device developers, 
clinical scientists, drug developers, uh, physicians that came together to make this work happen. How did this work start? This project was actually born as we were preparing going public with Digital Medicine Society and planning to launch the website. We wanted to have some early projects and this project was on my mind a lot. I came to the digital medicine field from the laboratory field and specifically uh, biomarker assay field. Prior to um, digital moving into the digital field, I spent more than a decade designing, validating, doing tech transfer and implementing biomarker assays in clinical trials. When I started working on digitally measured biomarkers and started going to the workshops and conferences, I had a strong feeling of deja vu. I've heard all these conversations about challenges in the field a decade, decade ago at the laboratory biomarkers conferences because people were talking about how do we get these tools accepted in the field? What is uh, the commonly accepted language? Which framework we use? What are the standards? And how do we get on the same page about methodologies? And it's an intersection of multiple fields that brings different points of view to the table, but they have to be reconciled to get on the same page. And at the same um, conferences where I've heard this, I would get to the podium and say, hey, are you aware that these problems have been already discussed and to great degree solved in other fields? Can we learn from these fields? And people wouldn't understand what I'm talking about because they're not biomarker laboratory assay scientists. And when I'm mentioning ligand binding assays or immunohistochemistry, it's not immediately apparent what that thing is, for instance, for a data analyst or a software developer. And that's how this project was born. I have written the project description. We posted it on the DIME Research Committee website. People signed up and here the work started. We wanted to do a research comparing the two field laboratory biomarkers and digitally measured biomarkers to draw valuable lessons and making sure that these field doesn't reinvent the wheel, but learns from other disciplines and moves the field forward. The first exercise we did, we mapped on a timeline the events of technology invention, inventions and their biomedical um, applications. And when we superimposed the key events in the um, technology development and their biomedical applications, there was nothing immediately apparent why lab biomarkers are more advanced and a little bit ahead than the digital ones. But the pattern started emerging when we looked for events that actually shaped the field in terms of agreement on definitions, frameworks, and it became apparent that the laboratory biomarker field was earlier. These slide leads list the key events that basically shaped the field how it is today. If you look for any clinical study protocol, it will have a few laboratory biomarkers. This is pretty standard. Nobody argues that these measurement tools add value and are integral part of drug development. The field started coming together in 2000, uh, 2001 with NIH biomarker definition working group that basically got everyone on, on the same page, what we are calling biomarker, what we are calling endpoint, what we are calling um, a surrogate endpoint. And the next big step was done by um, American Association of Pharmaceutical Sciences, AAPS biomarker workshop that basically defined 
fit for purpose concept, which laid out very important framework of how the validation experiments should be designed, how to execute them, and what uh, is the interpretation criteria to make sense out of the data. The these two work streams were uh, consolidated in the BEST framework, which basically summarized the results of almost a decade long discussion and very importantly incorporated in 2018 FDA biomarker qualification evidentiary framework that is actually a tool agnostic but summarized all work that has been going from early 2000 to provide robust guidance for biomarker-based tools for drug development. If we look for digitally measured biomarkers and look for key similar events, then it becomes apparent that there is a time lag. In my opinion, the first and very important event in the field was 2017 CTTI Digital Health Technologies recommendations that basically provided the first framework from which people working in the field can learn, oh, this is what I should be doing. Two other events, and I'm proud to say that they came from this organization, from DIME. It was what we call V3 framework, verification, analytical, and clinical validation to determine how a biometric monitoring technology, basically something based on a sensor, can be fit for purpose, which is highly analogous to the AAPS biomarker workshop. And this is not in the paper, but it came last week, and I'm really proud that DIME has accomplished it. It's a playbook, which is an industry guide for developing and deploying digital clinical measures. So these are the events, but how similar and how different are these two different biomarker measurement tools, laboratory and digital? This table is a um, adaptation from uh, and simplified version from the paper. If you want more detail, please um, use the link on this slide, but let's compare to these two categories. And what becomes apparent that goals and role in biomedical research is shared by these two different um, categories. The definitions of biomarkers, types, and categories, uh, whether it's um, prognostic, diagnostic, or predictive are the same, regardless of how they measurement. But there are a number of fundamental differences, and I'm listing here only a few. This is not an uh, all-inclusive list, just to demonstrate an example. For instance, human factor testing is really important for biomets, and it evaluates human interaction with a device and ease of use. With laboratory biomarkers, it doesn't exist because it all limits to the sample drawn or taken from the subject. We are talking really about, about really different data structure. With laboratory biomarker assays, again, it's all limited to a certain samples, which is snapshot at a time, it reflects what ha was happening in a particular tissue when the sample was taken. With uh, biomats or bio uh, digitally measured biomarkers, it can be continuous uh, or very frequent data collection for extended period of times, days and weeks. And both categories have bench and human subject testing phase and they sound identical, but they're actually not. And in the next slide, I'm going to explain the differences because they are fundamental. 
On the right, you see how the laboratory biomarker assays uh, being validated. The process is to consist of two phases. Bench uh, stage, which is analytical validation when assay performance characteristics are established, sample collection procedure is being verified to be appropriate for the data collection methods and sample stability measures. It requires human specimens and is done always retrospectively. It doesn't require any human experimentation other than appropriate collection of the informed consent form. Then these measurements are implemented in clinical studies where the inference about the association with outcome of interest is being done. If we look for digital biomarkers that are collected by means of deploying biomats in human experimentation, it is different. So the first step would be a verification, which is analogous to analytical validation of a biomarker assay when sensor performance is compared against a bench standard. For instance, it would be a um, uh, shake table for an accelerometer just to make sure that the acceleration measured by a sensor is correct at certain frequency and amplitude. The next step, the concept that certain digitally biomarker, digitally measured biomarker captures needs to be checked for accuracy and making sure that physiological or behavioral concept of interest is accurate. This can be done only in human subject study. And this is a fundamental difference. Once this step is passed, the clinical validation step is basically analogous to laboratory biomarkers because it draws the association with clinical outcome of interest. But if we need to summarize what is common again for these two processes, it's what is reflected in the FDA evidentiary framework that we need to specify sources or materials for measurements. We need to have very well documented methods for obtaining the measurements and methods and criteria for interpreting the results. Our team has taken this concept and considered a number of use cases that are described in the papers in order to understand what the digital biomarker field needs to move forward and get to the place where laboratory biomarkers are. And we have drawn a number of conclusions that Ben will uh, describe in the next slide. Thanks, Elena. Uh, so yeah, so uh, as Elena just mentioned, uh, based on everything that's discussed in the paper, we, we formulate a number of recommendations uh, that we really see critical to move the field as a whole uh, forward. And that first recommendation is that because we know that there is this vast experience with traditional lab-based biomarkers that were uh, consolidated into qualification frameworks, that we should not try to do uh, to, uh, to, to, to reinvent the wheel for digital biomarkers and we can really adapt and extend those existing frameworks to be compatible with digital biomarkers. Also important to note, and as most of you probably know, for the FDA there is no difference between a digital biomarker and a biomarker. It is another type of biomarkers and they are covered by the same regulatory uh, requirements. So uh, we're really advocating for making sure that we leverage the existing knowledge and the existing frameworks and build from those when it comes to some of the more specific requirements for digital uh, biomarkers. So moving on to the second recommendation, the, um, as, as Elena already pointed out, we have this, this piece of work from DIME, the V3 framework, which, is, uh, which is, is, is critical to make sure that we can map these different steps of verification, analytical validation and clinical validation, that we can map them out and that we can use them consistently for new biomets and new digital biomarkers based off of uh, biomet signals moving forward and having that feedback of people continuously moving through this process should allow us to really 
update and harmon, uh, harmonize those, those performance criteria, again, the qualification framework, and make sure that it uh, becomes something living and evolving that can, that can help the entire field forward. Then for recommendation three and four, so there's a new batch there because here it starts to deviate a little bit from what is uh, common for the traditional lab-based uh, biomarkers. And Elena already pointed it out that one important thing is that these biomats, they usually or almost always have a direct interface with a patient. Uh, they are literally stuck to somebody's skin or you're wearing them somewhere. So that really kind of requires a different way of thinking where you need to engage very early on in the development process with all the stakeholders, especially patients, to make sure that it is something that will actually be usable under those uh, circumstances. And typically what you see in, in the more consumer focused device space is that that requires iterative design principles, which often don't really, you know, they're not usually that compatible with regulatory requirements but engaging very early in the process with regulators can also help in actually applying some of these design principles uh, very early on, making sure that you get feedback from all these stakeholders and that you can incorporate that into a, a digital biomarker and or the device that it's using to, uh, to derive its data from. Um, and then as a final point, uh, which we summarize in the paper, sorry, can you go back to the previous slide, which we summarize under recommendation four, but it is kind of connected to, uh, to this general idea. Because this is a very, very new field uh, and it is highly multidisciplinary, it is also important to ensure that uh, the entire community kind of rallies around it. And the only way to do that is to make sure that they understand all the new principles. So we need, really need to make, we need to focus on, on ensuring user literacy. And that is of course something where DIME is, uh, is very important. Then the next uh, recommendation, uh, again, it's a combination of, of two recommendations that we split in the paper. They're very much focused on the fact that this is data, data, data collection. Compared to traditional lab-based uh, biomarkers, the amount of data that biomets can collect is way, way higher. It's a different type of data. It's, it's longitudinal, uh, multiple streams, multimodal data often. So that is a different, uh, requires a different mindset and it requires some updates in the principles that we use to process that data. Um, and so fair and transparent use of, of, uh, of, of data, data governance principles that are very transparent is very important to not only generate trust with the entire community, but also making sure that we can get the maximum clinical value, uh, that we can derive the maximum clinical value of the data that we collect. It's not only about collecting data, you actually need to do something useful with it. And the more transparent the way you process it, the easier it becomes for other people to extend whatever work you, uh, you started. And uh, as, as so recommendation five extends, uh, sorry, recommendation seven extends on that from a, a very machine learning uh, focused aspect. Machine learning, as, as you may know, is, is a new, it's not new, but it, it's, a, it's a, a more widely applied set of, uh, of tools uh, over the last few, uh, over the last years that is becoming more and more important to deal with these ever extending and ever enlarging databases and, 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 and our ability to collect all this data. Uh, but they are often seen as, you know, this black box, you put data in, something comes out and, and the user, the end user is blinded to what actually goes on under the hood. Um, so there is also a need to be very transparent there and making sure that as a field, we try to build algorithms that generate actionable data in a very transparent manner, because that will also assist in making sure that there's trust in the community to use these algorithms in the first place and continuously improve them. And then as a final point, uh, our recommendation six in the paper, uh, that's, that's kind of a, a no brainer, but still it, it, it deserves a mention, is that there is really a need for the entire field to share our results all the way from very preliminary feasibility studies to full scale clinical validation studies and everything in between in order to make recommendation one and two possible, to make sure that those quality uh, uh, qualification frameworks for biomarkers can be extended to the digital space, we need to make sure that they are uh, continuously evolving and that we can adapt them uh, to make it, to, to move the entire field of digital medicine forward. And for that, we all need to do our best to, to uh, share relevant results with the entire community and, and communicate openly about them. So I will leave it at that uh, as far as the recommendations uh, go. Uh, Elena, I'm not sure if you wanted to add anything else before we jump into questions. No, I think, Ben, you covered very nicely the conclusions of our paper. And I think it's time when we start taking questions from the audience. 
Jan, can you please moderate the conversation? Absolutely. I will stop sharing. Um, and Ben and Elena, that was absolutely terrific. So um, for folks on the line, um, I have gone ahead, um, I've given everyone sort of, uh, I sound awful saying this, sort of permission to speak. Um, so Christine, there's a great question here from you. Would you like to unmute yourself and give that voice? Sure. <laughs> I was going to say no. Um, so when we think about laboratory biomarkers, I know there are a lot of um, established standards already out there for data collection and exchange. So you have um, things like HL7V3, you've got FHIR, some of those things that are um, more established. But what about in digital biomarkers? We've been looking at a variety of different sensors and wearables, and they all seem to sort of pick their own. So I'm wondering if there's some um, guidance that you have as far as how we establish commonality and how we um, understand the format of the digital biomarker data that we receive. Um, I will start answering your question, uh, Christine. Uh, this is an excellent question and um, you described the challenge in the field very accurately. If you look at this paper, what we analyzed that for a certain type of technology that captures certain biological data, there are standards or guidance in the field if you want to validate ligand binding assay or genetic assay or immunohistochemistry assay, you need to establish parameter X, Y, and Z. And they're usually technology dependent because each technology has its own limitations. What we proposed in this manuscript is that this is a future work because the type of physiological or cognitive concepts that you can interrogate with these devices is very large. And that's what you just observed that each sensor kind of trying to make its own way. The way how it, to approach it is to categorize them in a physiological concept that need to be queried. And for each physiological concept, it should be the list of basically a to-do list. If you want to establish gait and balance characteristics, this is what you need to do, starting with selecting an appropriate sensor, verifying that sensor, and establishing analytical performance characteristics before the conclusion can be drawn uh, of the analytic uh, clinical validity in a clinical trial where a certain outcome is being measured. This is a work in the future. We didn't provide uh, the ready recipe for this work because it's going to be a huge amount of work, but we wanted to point out researchers that this would be the beginning. And the more example we get in the field of how it's been done, and Ben a little bit alluded to this, putting the insights and the results of these validation experiments will inform the field how to establish these characteristics so we can have the same smooth sailings as laboratory biomarkers have these days. Ben, do you want to add anything here? Uh, I'm not going to add anything to, to what you just said because I think that, that you know, sketches out exactly the, the, the field as it is right now. One thing that maybe a bit on a, on a tangent, but from uh, approaching this from somebody working at a company where we are actually building devices that that provide this data, it is very important, in my opinion, that the manufacturers of of these not only devices but also the algorithms that process the data that they have an open mindset about sharing the data, uh, and that comes back to your point about uh, the different standards that can be used to shuttle this data around. If as a manufacturer you are open about providing the data for other people to use and ingest in their systems, there really isn't that much problem. We still need to, as a field, come up with, with the standards to make sure that it's very clear under what circumstances what should be used. That is, that's exactly what, uh, what Elena was pointing out. But a first step there, a first very important enabler for that is to make sure that the data from all these different devices, whether they're commercial or academic entities, 
is available in open source formats, which is compatible with pulling it into all these other systems for further processing and further validation. Fantastic. Um, Christine, that was a tremendous question and I think really important. Um, Elena and Ben, as usual, you tackled um, a tough question um, uh, very well. I can see um, uh, Shipan. Um, I'm going to unmute you if you would like to pose your question. Uh... Hey, thank you. Um, thank you so much. So uh, I guess I could, and please let me know if my audio is poor. But it's a continuation of the question that was just raised and answered. So I mainly work on a preclinical side um, and looking for video um, analysis of uh, our in vivo models. Um, and this is still pretty new also, I believe, on the clinical side as well. But one of the things that we're finding is that having a hardware agnostic analytical platform for something like skeletal points is really for us to move moving forward would be the, the best way to do that. Because with each video collection platform that we have utilized and we have worked with or considering, it analyzes that uh, slightly differently. And if we wanted to expand additional um, or extract additional digital biomarkers from that video, it makes it even more challenging. Um, so I'd be curious to, to hear um, and again, I understand with the video, with the privacy and all of the other issues that come, there's still a challenge um, on the clinical side, which at this stage in the preclinical side, we don't have that. And by preclinical, again, I mean in vivo work. Um, so I'd be curious if uh, the group here um, has thought about that, you know, video data. Um, on the, on the, or even on the clinical side, and if they're keeping a uh, hardware agnostic uh, analytics platform. So, Ben, do you want me to answer, or are you going to take this question? I don't know if it was a question or a comment, probably both. Yeah, I, I, I can try to comment. I, I did not. It, the audio connection was not great. Uh, so, what I gathered was the, the main question was on the level of uh, having open source or not necessarily open source, but analytics platforms that can ingest data from different sources and so that there is some transparency in the way the data is processed. Uh, that, that's what I gathered from, from the question. And uh, in, in the paper, if, if that's, if I understood correctly in the paper, we highlight a couple of uh, efforts in that respect uh, with OpenML tools and a couple of other uh, initiatives that are related, that, that uh, are the work of some of the co-authors on the paper that are exactly trying to establish that, trying to establish these uh, more easily accessible analytics platforms so that it also becomes possible for certain biomarkers or for certain insights that are derived from this data to start working from a common base of algorithms. Uh, now that's something that, you know, I, on my opinion there on the matter is that as a field, this is not going to be easy. It is going to be incredibly hard to rally everybody around the single platform because uh, because there, there's always going to be, you know, I don't know if, if you're familiar with the idea of, you know, if, if you, you've got seven standards, so let's try to make it into one standard so that everybody can move from that. And then there were eight standards and, you know, process, continue that process. Uh, so th that's something that, from, from the data analytics side, that, that is always going to be a problem. I think what would make a lot of sense is just that if there are a number of these platforms that people are actively developing on, that they will start learning from each other. That if you have one particular platform that has a very clear cut case for, let's say, to take the example that Elena was giving about certain insights derived from accelerometer data, like let's say uh, gate dynamics or anything like that, that if one particular platform is very strong on that level and if they have an open mindset about sharing how it works and what they're doing with it, that that is something that can be an, an, an incentive for a platform that is, for instance, focused on, on cardiac monitoring and, and cardiac uh, parameters to kind of try and bundle forces and not reinvent the wheel over and over again. That might be a bit naive, uh, because you know there's different drivers in this field, including commercial and uh, and and, and money-driven drivers. Uh, but but it, I would personally think it's fantastic if we can you know make steps in that direction. I'm not sure if that answered your question. Again, the audio was was a bit choppy.
Um, I think that um, Shei Shei Pan may have uh, dialed back in on the phone. Um, so I, Shei Shei Pan, did you get that? Yes, no, thank you. So uh, I really appreciate that. Um, and, and to a certain extent, it does answer the question um, and I might connect with you guys offline um, to grasp more details. Of sure. course. Um, Shei Shei Pan, one of the things I really liked about the question you asked, um, and if I heard it correctly, you were thinking about using um, sort of uh, video uh, based data to sort of infer these biomarkers that the sort of the vast sort of possibility of different sort of digital biomarkers. And I'm going to use this if I can to sort of make the transition to a question I have um, for, for you guys, Elena and Ben, which is, you know, what I love about this paper is how you extend existing best practices and really think about the fact that a lot of thought has gone into high quality measurement and evaluation for decades. And we have this sort of very robust tried and tested sort of um, corpus of how we do this. Um, and Elena, your sort of vignette of, you know, oftentimes you'll be sort of at a more digitally inclined con uh, conference and you'll sort of suggest that we leverage this sort of, uh, this body of work and people look surprised that it even exists. How can we, in addition to sort of forums like this and publications um, and these sort of wonderful recommendations, how can we bang the drum a little bit? How can we make this more accessible? The recommendations that you propose are even more powerful if they're broadly adopted. Um, what's your vision for that? Um, and then I'd also like to throw that open to folks on the line, but Ben and Elena, let's hear from you first. Okay, I will start and I want also Ben to add his perspective. So this paper was the first step. The seminar is a second in disseminating knowledge and make people aware that this information exists. So I suggest that this topic needs to be included in the conference agendas because a lot of conferences like including Cambridge Healthcare Institute, Hanson Wide, conduct conferences in both fields and the hybrid approach might be important making sure that we don't continue reinventing the wheel in silos and we talk to each other. For instance, next month I'm presenting at AAPS conference. It's the same conference that hosted the working group that coined fit for purpose term. And for me, it's going back home because that's where I came from. And now I'm going to tell the folks, you know, this is what I learned from you, and I'm bringing you back uh, knowledge. It's just one example how we can help disseminate. And it's very important to have continuous, productive discussions to understand how our knowledge evolves and what we can do to make this paradigm shift. And I'm using use Thomas Kuhn's um, concept of paradigm shift when there is enough scientific knowledge accumulation that makes people look at the problem different. Right now, I would define the digital medicine field which this society serves as pre-shift area. And it's up to us how to make this shift happen, how soon it's going to be and how it's going to happen. Ben, do you want to comment yeah, more here? I, sure, and and I'm gonna I'm gonna be mainly echoing what you just said that it's it's also I agree that it's primarily about outreach, which is exactly the mission of Dime. Uh, maybe to give one anecdotal example, uh, we actually in, in in the devices that that uh, that we are working on, we actually set up our uh, you know when you when you build devices, medical devices, you have to have a lot of paperwork. Uh, we actually set up our structure to follow V3 now so that we have verification, the concepts of verification, analytical validation, clinical validation in there because we completely agree with the way it's structured in that very recent paper and that it makes a lot of sense. And as we also highlight in this paper, that it makes a lot of sense to organize the work we do in this field according to those principles. When you talk to people at the FDA, uh, you can mention that paper and they'll be like, yeah, yeah, maybe they've heard of it or you know, they, they acknowledge it. We did the same thing with our notified body in Europe, and they looked at us like, you know, what the hell are you talking about? What, what is this? Um, so there's, there's a lot of room for improvement there to educate the entire field 
uh, about these principles and and to and and you know two birds one stone hopefully also uh, rally people around the concepts and make them understand that it works and 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 the more people adapt it you know the, the more we'll figure out where and how they can be applied and where they may fail um I, I, I couldn't agree more that it's about engagement and outreach. And I wonder if I can pose um, a question, um, put, put, put our experts who have dialed in to, to participate in the conversation on the spot a little bit. I'd be curious to learn from folks on the line, sort of how you take publications like this, how do you take these recommendations, these frameworks and bring them back to your teams and say, you know, we're able to draw the, the lines between what we're proposing we do here on our work on digital, we can connect it to this body of work that's broadly accepted um, with lab biomarkers. Um, if anyone's comfortable sort of sharing whether that approach is sort of more valuable for you as you work with your teams, um, and if there's anything else that you need to take this sort of, this piece of work, these recommendations, hopefully this manuscript that can support you in your work um, and grease the wheels even further. Um, and uh, Hao Zhang, I'm going to um, unmute you and then Xie Xie Pan, you're next. Um, how I'm going to, there you go. We've got you. Yeah. <laughs> I think so. I think I was right. more getting in the way than being helpful. I apologize. <laughs> yeah. Thank you all for, for the presentation. Uh, I think. This is really helpful, and I think this is exactly what the field needs. I came in from a background um, in basic research. I didn't, I wasn't aware of the biomarker uh, field of work, but I, I had the same uh, thought because there were a lot of similarities. So really appreciate Lena for putting forward this uh, analogy and uh, push for the, um, the consensus and, and getting the fields to work uh, work on this path that will really be very, very useful. So my question is related to the comment uh, we just heard that, for example, in, uh, for EMA, the response to this, this, this idea may be, uh, we are not sure, we, we didn't know about this. So, um, is, this, so is, is currently our thinking more focused on uh, working together with the U.S. Uh, regulatory agency like FDA? Uh, how do we think about doing it in more internationally? Um, how, first of all, many thanks for your kind words and your initial comments. It's music to my ears and I cannot thank you enough for what you just said. Um, to answer your question about how we make it more international, again, it's about stakeholder engagement and disseminating um, knowledge because I know from personal experience, knowledge dissemination and understanding and processing, it's not a snap of the fingers. It takes time to understand, to process, to understand applicability. And I think in DIME, we have a perfect community that can help with this knowledge uh, dissemination and the attendance of this seminar today is a testimonial. And here we have a number of engaged members. And as we go to different forums, some of them will be domestic, US or Europe. Some will be international, bring this up bring this up as a meeting agenda, bring this up as a discussion point. Feel free to reach out to Ben, myself, or any of the co-authors on the papers. Share it within your organization and ask a question, what does it mean for us? What can we learn from this? What can we leverage going back to uh, Sepan's questions? How do we leverage this knowledge in translating preclinical data into clinic that on its own has its own challenges? And whenever you can put your learning, your experience and your results in the public domain so we all can learn, that's how the field moves.
Um, Elena, <clears throat> I think that was a tremendous answer to that question um, and how I think, I think what you've identified there is the need for sort of harmonization writ large, whether that's across regulatory regions, whether that's across different um, sort of uh, stakeholders within a given industry. Um, you know, the great example is sort of our uh, sort of technically focused colleagues um, who do sort of the hardware all the way through to, you know, our clinical colleagues really having that shared sort of framework and understanding. And I think that um, Elena and Ben, the work in your co-authors, what you've done here is be really thoughtful about that sort of harmonization. And rather than looking to identify what's different, what's the same, what we can, what's, what can we extrapolate and how can we learn? Um, and so I think that mindset, and as you said, that sort of a focus on engagement and outreach is exactly right. Um, I always try and finish a few minutes early. I, 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 we are all in back-to-back uh, -back Zoom meetings these days, but I want to make sure uh, before we transition to, uh, to close, um, I'm gonna take a pause for a moment and let anyone else um, air any additional questions. Fantastic. So um, the most important thing to say is um, Ben and Elena, thank you so much um, for joining us today um, and walking us through this tremendous uh, paper. This is, um, and hopefully, uh, can you guys, uh, I've put a slide back on the screen. Can you see that? Yes. Fantastic. Um, this was a terrific conversation. We covered a lot in terms of content, strong recommendations that we can all take back um, to our teams, to our work. Um, but also a testament to the sort of high quality work that can be achieved um, under the leadership of um, the Dime Research community. And I appreciate you both for your leadership there. Um, and Elena, especially as a co-chair of the research committee. Um, I also uh, am very grateful for everyone joining today. This was um, a really terrific group. We try and keep these um, conversations small so we can truly engage and we were able to do that today. So I'm um, very grateful to um, Ben and Elena, um, Ben and Elena also to all of your co-authors um, on this terrific paper and everyone who joined today. Um, a quick heads up on a few things that are coming down the pike, should you care to join us. Um, our journal club in October is scheduled for October 21st. Um, and Christine Manta and Bray Patrick Lake will be lead leading a discussion of our most recently published paper, um, uh, really focused on making sure that as we develop these digital measures, we really are focusing um, on what matters most to patients. And again, we have a very action-oriented framework uh, to discuss there. Um, and with that, Elena, Ben, thank you again. Thank you everyone for dialing in um, and spending some time with us this Tuesday lunchtime. Um, as Elena said, please do share this tremendous manuscript broadly um, and we appreciate the role that you each play in our community. So thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.